And so it was a very interesting juxtaposition of becoming a monk guy and letting go of all the ideas of what life is supposed to be about and what you're doing versus what other people are doing and accepting everyone's path and just, just being a guy doing his thing. And, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure. There's a lot of everything at, at that age. And so, um, what a gift, right? It was, it was an incredible gift, but it wasn't easy, right? It's, it's a lot easier to, you know, I don't know, join the fraternity, uh, get the white picket fence, do the job thing, get the car thing and follow the formula. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the matrix. Boom. Dr. Pedro Sojayi, thanks for coming for coming on the show. Great to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and uh you've you've sounds like you've done uh quite a lot and you're still doing uh, so many different things right now. You're of course a doctor of oriental medicine. You are a New York Times bestselling author of the Urban Monk, The Art of Stopping Time, the founder of well.org. You're doing so many different things, but one of the things that really fascinated me and caught my attention was your history uh, and really your story of being a Taoist monk for four years of your life. And I would love to dig into this as a starting point for us, which is how did you go from selling uh, or chasing down insurance companies in your 20s to <laughs> tr you know, pursuing this life of uh, Taoism? Yeah, it kind of landed on my lap, frankly. Um, I was pre-med at UCLA, going down the track of, you know, what you do when in our generation, it was doctor, lawyer, engineer, you know, as an immigrant kid, you just study and you do your thing. And um, then I started meeting the people whose lives I was trying to emulate and was like, wow, <laughs> you're not happy. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and it became very confusing um, trying to decide to, you know, look down the barrel of a life that isn't necessarily uh, fulfilling to you. Right. And so, what, what do you do at that age? You know, you're 18 years old trying to figure out and, uh, in, in a culture. We have a very um, a culture that has you proclaim who you're going to be before you know who you are. Right. So I'm going to be a doctor person. I'm going to hang out with doctor people and, you know, then interact with patient people. And, and you know, the, the, this whole game that we play here. And when that started to come apart and I started to question that trajectory, I asked God for a, a clue and a book fe fell out of a bookshelf, um, which isn't supposed to happen. Right. And so I read the book. It was a, it was a, a book about Taoism and I'm like, you know, I'd heard about this stuff, but like, whoa, what is this? Um, and I just kind of followed those breadcrumbs, found a Taoist, um, school in Los Angeles. Turned out he was a senior student of one of the most serious abbots who had fled the cultural revolution. <clears throat> you know, these guys, they weren't treated well, right? You know, when Mao took over, they went to the temples, killed everyone, burned down the temples and were like, no more. Now it's, you, you don't have any culture. You're a communist, you're Chinese. That's what we do now. Right. And so my grandmaster happened to be off property, um, uh, at another temple, uh, when the communists showed up, killed everyone he knew, burned down the temple. And they basically, someone smuggled him out to Chinatown, San Francisco. Uh, and then eventually he made his way down to Los Angeles and became, um, the teacher of my teacher. Um, and it turned out he was, you know, this legitimate lineage holding, um, monk abbot from the yellow dragon monastery. And they basically rebuilt the lineage um, here because everything got burned down there. And so I stumbled in and became the senior student of his senior student and then studied with the old man and suddenly found myself training in all this crazy stuff and becoming a monk under this lineage and taking a quarter off. I, I, you know, I couldn't drop out of school or any of that. My parents would have lynched me. And so, you know, I, I did it all while going to UCLA, while, while, while. Um, and then every quarter I'd go off on sabbatical and go meditate for, you know, a month here, or, you know, three weeks there. Um, and um, yeah, what a wild ride. Man, what were your friends saying when you were telling them that you were going through these meditation retreats or I don't even know how you would even phrase it to people in UCLA? 
Yeah, it was it was a weird time, right? When you're 18, 19, trying to figure out who you are, still interested in girls, still interested in, you know, the things that you were programmed to be interested in. Suddenly you're doing all these things that kind of pull you out from there. And, and you know, you're doing this thing where you, then you go to a party and you're like, wow, these guys are idiots right now, right? And, and, and you know, just people just getting drunk and anesthetized and, and doing stupid things. And, and so you start to really understand um, – you know, the, the trajectory that you were on and, and then you got to, you know, so the first thing people do, I think when going onto a spiritual path and trying to identify themselves is they, you know, their egos like, Oh, now I'm a spiritual guy. Right. So, so, you know, you know, the first step is, you know, you get judgy and then you got to come back from being judgy because they're just kids, you know, trying to figure it out too and doing their thing. And so it was a very interesting juxtaposition of becoming a monk guy and letting go of, all the ideas of what life is supposed to be about and what you're doing versus what other people are doing and accepting everyone's path and just, just being a guy doing his thing. And, you know, there's a lot of peer pressure. There's a lot of everything at at that age. And so, um, what a gift, right? It was, it was an incredible gift, but it wasn't easy, right? It's, it's a lot easier to, you know, I don't know, join the fraternity, uh, get the white picket fence, do the job thing, get the car thing and follow the formula. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's the matrix. Right. And so it was, it was a very interesting time when I had already been indoctrinated with Scooby-Doo and Ferraris are cool to then be pulled out because usually they grab the kids before they get all that crap dumped into them for the monastery. Absolutely. I mean, especially living in LA, we were just talking about, you know, the, the status like quo and comparing and the egos that exist around that environment. And 18 is when you're at an age of finally, okay, I get to go to college and I get to hook up with girls. And it's like a time when you're figuring out who you really are and what you want to do. There's just so many variables. And here you are going in this completely different linear, uh, you know, perpendicular path, I would say, of going into Taoism. So what is the pathway from studying Taoism into becoming or calling yourself uh, a Taoist monk? Yeah. Great question. And it's, you know, it was a little gray area because the temple had burned down. Right. And so I started training, man, about 30 hours a week, Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Xing Yi, Bagua, um, you know, uh, Qigong, obviously all these things that like most people don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. And so I started studying all this stuff and just doing all this Jedi stuff. And, you know, right around the six month mark, um, and let me let me qualify this by saying, you know, I was called to this place. And then when I walk in this place, the master comes across the whole studio, walks by my buddy that I brought over there, walks straight over to me and says, you know, I've been expecting you. Right. And I'm like, I, yeah, I guess I'm here. Right. Like mm. it, it was all this this weird, you know, stars aligning type of thing to begin with. <clears throat> what do you think he meant when and he I said thought, he's expecting you? Like he he's he heard knew. about you before? No, he knew he got tapped. He got tapped on the shoulder by someone, you know, in the lineage energetically and said, we're sending you a student. And then I showed up the next day. I can't explain this stuff. You know what I mean? And I'm like, "Uh, okay. Um, I, I also asked God for a clue and a book about Taoism fell out. So I'm, I'm way over my skis now. Like, you know, what, what else you got? Right. Like at that point, you just have to kind of suspend judgment and be like, this is just purely weird. (laughs) <laughs> right. Like this is, this got weird. And so, you know, it wasn't creepy weird. It was cool weird, but it was, you know, it was like movie, movie weird, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is like, is this my destiny? Like how did this happen? And so I just started studying and all of a sudden I was like, Whoa, I love this. Right. Like I'm getting stronger. I could, I could feel the energy coursing through my body. Um, my mind was calming and like all these benefits, right? Obviously from these practices started coming and I was like, wow, I'm really into this. And six months later he said, Hey, listen, we are, um, reviving the lineage. Um, there's only three abbots that were kind of trained through the, the old man, the great grandmaster before. And, um, it's time. And he's like, I have, you know, four of my black belts and I'm like a why, like I don't even have, like, I think I just got my white belt. It takes six, six months and a lot of work to just get a white belt in Kung Fu. Um, And he invited, he's like, I want you to be part of this. And I'm like, with all these elder students and all these people that have been there for eight years. And he's like, "Um, yeah, I want you in this. And it was one of those things where I said yes before even thinking about it because it was such an honor. Mm -hmm. Right. And I was like, oh, two years of celibacy. Oh, 
this, that, and the other. And it was like, wow, I should have read the fine print. At 18, um, but here right? We are. Huh? Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Right. Best thing I could have done though, because you know, at 18 you have this, it's like a, a powder keg of sexual energy that drives 80% of your behavior and your interactions and all the things that kind of drive you to be a knucklehead boy and do stupid things, you know, to attract a mate, if you will. And I was able to put a cap on that, on that thing and, and focus it and direct that life force energy in a way that allowed me to be able to, you know, I could manifest what I want now. You know, I have multiple books, multiple films. I could do what I want because I understand how to tap into that sexual energy Right. And, and use it in a, in a powerfully um, productive way. Right. It's like the, the metaphor I use in, in my new book is it's like um, you could put a bunch of TNT in a powder keg and light it and it just blows up. It's an explosion and a chaos. But if you direct it, like, say, in a rocket and pick a direction, then it's propulsion. Right. So mm -hmm. it's an explosion versus propulsion. And I was able to learn the art of propulsion by learning how what that energy even is and how to cultivate and tap it and circulate it and use it instead of just squandering it at yeah. such a young age wasn't you're saying, easy <laughs> no kidding and you're saying this we all have this inner energy and most people at the age of 18 most likely a lot of people even into their 40s they channel that into perhaps unproductive things like chasing girls chasing guys Whereas you were able to channel that into something much more productive. Yeah. I mean, I was that, I mean, that's really the name of the game in Tantra is to take that energy, understand what it is and use that fire to steam into your spiritual centers and, and awaken. Right. And there's a very profound lineage from Taoism. There's another one in, in, you know, the, the Shivite, um, you know, Hindu sects. There's a lot of, a lot of Tantra to be taught if people understand what Tantra is. Um, and, you know, then there's a lot of misunderstandings of Tantra, you know. Um, sure. And so once you learn how to tap into that energy, you are a force of nature. You've tapped into the force of nature, right? Yeah. And then you realize what that is. Again, that's just part of the stuff I studied. That's part of the lineage. Um, and, you know, I had to learn to <laughs> bottle that genie at the highest expression of that energy. No right? kidding. And what are the, some of the things that they were teaching you on a day-to-day -day basis? You mentioned not just the ability to control your mind, but you were talking about some of the physical things like Kung Fu and some of the Tai Chi as well. And and because I think most people know about Buddhism. That's much seems to be more popular in the Western world or from a recognition perspective. But uh, what are some of the things that you were learning and how are some of those different from Buddhism? Yeah. So, I mean, I've learned a lot of Buddhist practices, a lot of Buddhist Qigong, uh, Buddhist Shaolin, Buddhist Kung Fu. Um, so the Buddhist and Taoists really hung out. There wasn't this like, you know, us versus them stuff that we get in the West. Um, and I studied with the Dalai Lama. I mean, I've, I've been with the Buddhists a lot and I, I'm down for the Buddhists, right? Um, Taoism, philosophical Taoism is the philosophy of balance, the harmony of yin and yang and finding balance in everything. And the Taoist practices, um, they have qigong, they have kung fu. We, I guess, have qigong, we have kung fu, we have meditation, all chemical practices. And these are, some of them look like tai chi and qigong where you're moving and your eyes are focused on your hands and all the stuff that you, you know, you see old people doing in the park kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And some of it is you're just sitting down with your eyes closed and it looks like you're meditating, but you're circulating energy. You're steaming from your lower abdomen to your heart, to your third eye. There's all sorts of stuff, internal practices that come with the cultivation of breath and focusing the mind internally on what it is that you're doing and, and really becoming aware of the internal landscape in the universe. We call it retroflexion in my tradition. And, um, you know, there was, there was a lot, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of manuscripts and old, you know, kind of documents that, that I would read. Um, there was a lot of meditation and, and Kung Fu is a big part of it because, you know, in our tradition, they wouldn't even teach the energetic, stuff to anyone who didn't do the Kung Fu because their body was weak. Kung Fu translates to hard work. And so I had to 
make my body strong. Not because, you know, um, Kung Fu itself, it's like I wasn't necessarily interested in beating people up, right? That, that's not kind of history I came from. A lot of people go to the martial arts because they got bullied or whatever. I came because I wanted to be a Jedi. And um, the work strengthened my body to the point where I just could push through things I mean, to this day, you know, I had a guy show up yesterday, a couple of days ago with this balance program for skiers and he just threw me on it and he was like, holy crap, how the hell are you, ba- how, how are you so balanced? Yeah. Right. And it's just from years, it's like dividends, right? It's just interesting come from years of Kung Fu that built my legs in a way that, that allow me to just have that stability. But that's physical. What about mental stability? What, you know, some thing happens at work, some, you know, f- film shoot goes awry. So what? Right. It's having the mental resilience to understand that these are just circumstances and you, you, you know, you parry, you block, you move, you adjust and you just move on in life. So it's about mastering life through understanding, having an operating system that allows you to stand as a warrior and not get knocked off your perch. And that was a big part of the training. It was a big part of the training. It's still to me mentally the most important part of the training because most people in our world are victims. Oh, look at, you know. Look at what they've done to the environment. Look at what they're doing in Washington. Look at what they're doing with our, our lives and our future. And they don't have any agency to stand up and, and stand in their world to be a part of a solution. And there's always, you know, someone has to come in and help me because I'm a victim. That goes away when you learn to become a master of your own body, your own breath, and your own destiny. Right. So you would say a lot of what you were doing was was, was with the mind, the body, and the the spirituality, I guess. Those are kind of the three triangles that you were looking to master through those practices. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it was an ebb and a flow. And sometimes you just come up like you think you're doing some sort of spiritual practice and you realize that, you know, this thing that you do every day is actually in response to your dad being tough on you as a kid. And you have this behavioral thing that's just, you know, some sort of defense mechanism that you've developed over the years and you uncover all this, like all this crap about yourself that you're like, wow, that's terribly inefficient. Right. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of it is just kind of undoing your upbringing and, and cleaning up some of the, some of the programming that doesn't serve you as well. Yeah. And when I look at some of these, um, I guess it's religious practices, it, there, there is some similarities to let's say stoicism where they talk a lot about adaptability and how one's interpretation of life events is what will make it so meaning like if nothing is really bad in itself only our beliefs make it so there's some there's certainly some convergence to the beliefs that stoicism and a lot of these practices had it seems to let's say taoism oh yeah yeah um you know and that's the whole est training and and landmark training that came from Earhart um kind of took that from buddhism uh, in particular and, you know, what is it? It's it's not the event. It's my response to the event. It's my interpretation of the event. It's my narrative around the event. It's the stories that I create um, that, that become my story that create my suffering. And so you start disassembling all that and realizing that this is what it is in front of me and my interpretations don't matter. Yet my interpretations will lead to my aversions, my cravings, my suffering, my, you know, lack of peace. And then you come back into the nexus of control and choose whether or not you suffer. I mean, there's things that happen in front of you that actually do suck. I mean, people witness atrocities, you know, but again, it's, it's how you take that event and then you, you charge yourself moving forward or what you do in the present moment to engage and maybe be a catalyst for change to that event, right? Some people stand there and witness atrocities. Other people step up and stop them. Sure. Right. And, and the people who freeze have one narrative and the people who step up have another, right? And so all of that is just here. It's personal, right? It's in you. Now, were you able to, you know, when you were on a day-to-day basis living as a Taoist monk, were you able to still do the things that you were doing on a regular basis? Or did that require complete commitment of going to a temple, going into, you know, the studies and practicing all these things almost on a day-to-day basis? Um, there weren't any overt restrictions other than temporal ones. I just had so much to do. I was taking 24 units at UCLA getting straight A's cause that was the deal 
while doing 30 hours a week of Kung Fu, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, all the stuff that I was giving. Like, when the hell else do you have time? Like, I would literally go into a lecture hall. Everyone else would be sitting there, like, napping or whatever. And I would be 100% attentive because the next time I had to engage with the material that this guy was talking about was probably during the midterm exam. Mm. So either I got it right there and then, and I had the textbook in front of me and learned what it was. So I didn't have to go back and study for hundreds of hours. I would just sit there and absorb what it was. The lesson was and go through the chapter while he did it and be like, okay, I learned about, you know, X, Y, or Z. I had to find all the places where I would park up my body and go mindless and waste time and reabsorb that time. And in doing so, I reabsorbed the fragments of my soul and my spirit and became present in this body. Damn. So, right? <laughs> it was, it was so, it was tough at the time. It was like, yeah. you know, you could feel sorry for yourself all day, every day. But then on the other side of it, you're like, damn, now I get it. Now I get it. Don't waste a second. Don't waste a single heartbeat of this gift of life. Right. So then you, you take everything on as a warrior. Anyone knows. I mean, you know, it was Mike Tyson's fav famous quote, like, you know, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. And we have a, we have a, a, a saying in our martial arts, like, listen, I don't care how good you are. You stand in the ring long enough, you're going to get punched. Right. And so you, all you got to do is let down your guard. And so the question is, where do you let down your guard? Like, you know, we'd go to a lecture hall with 1200 people at UCLA, you know, some person up there yapping about chemistry and you're, you know, looking around for the cute girls, you're talking to your buddy, you're, you know what I mean? Like you're just sitting there, you're, you're, you're occupying that space, Yeah. but you're not present. You're not at the thing that you're supposed to be yet. You have to park your body there like some sort of prisoner and it's just, it's hell. It's suffering. Why don't you just learn the damn chemistry and then go play Frisbee or, you know, go do something else with your buddies. And so all of these little lessons came in the, the rigorous training that then translated to every, every walk of life, everything that I was doing. Yeah. And you, so you did this for four years, you graduated and at what age did you stop practicing? You know, again, I don't know how you would qualify not practicing as a Taoist monk, but what, what, right. when is that time that you decided not to officially call yourself not a monk. <laughs> monk. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was in 2001, so that's, tw you know, 26, I guess I was, um, I took my ordination. So once I became ordained as a minister in the lineage, then, you know, there's, I, it's like, okay, kid, you got what you need, go do it. Right. Um, and then I took off and took, a, I think a seven month sabbatical. I was in India Dharmsala with the Karmapa Lama, the Dalai Lama. I went through Nepal doing a high monastery tour, um, Thailand. There's just a bunch of masters on the list. So I did, I did about a seven month sabbatical through Asia, came back and then started the, you know, the doctor thing. Um, and at that point then I'm a minister of the lineage and, you know, doing my thing. And, you know, I basically continued my practices as a grown up, you know, you just don't need adult supervision at that point. Um, and then I think about a decade later, um, just out of nowhere, my, my, my grandmaster came and was like, you know, Hey, I have stuff for you and sat down and there was a big ceremony and I became an abbot. Um, you know, it was after I think writing my, my first book and a few other things where they'd just been kind of watching me and they're like, yeah, this guy's, you know, this guy's doing it. He gets it. Um, and so, you know, just after that, just be a good boy and keep doing it. Right. What's an um, abbot again? Abbot is the kind of like, it's the highest level um, of priest in the lineage kind of thing. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, does, it doesn't mean anything other than, you know, I paid my dues, not really. Right? Um, right. But for me, it's just, it's an, it's an honorary thing. Right? Sure. And how there's do very they keep few track of there's you? Three, there's three of these guys on, on planet Earth, and I happen to be one of them, right? Like, there's just very few oh, wow. people. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, you know, I don't I don't really wear the, the, like, spiritual dude thing, right? Like, I'm not like, oh, look at me, great, great Pedram Abbott guy, right? And so I've always been very dismissive of all of that because I think it, it becomes um, an identity that people wear, and then that identity becomes their nemesis. 
Mm. So I've been very, very careful about just being a dude, just being a guy, right? Like, I, yeah, I have all this lineage. I have all this stuff, all this training, but I'm only as good as my last bad decision. Yeah. And so, and I've seen so many people in the spiritual communities fall, develop pride and ego around their elevated status or, you know, start banging their disciples. And, you know, there's so many crappy things you see in these communities because what happens is you, you create this exalted persona or identity around a human who still has flaws, yeah. right? And then we start to deify a flawed human who cannot be honest with themselves anymore because abbots aren't flawed, right? And, and in doing so, we create a monster, right? So yes, I have, you know, done the work and received these things, but I'm only as good as my last bad decision, like I say. So I just, I'm just a human, you know, I'm just a human. And, you know, there's times where I get mad at my kids, <laughs> <laughs> right. But, but abbots don't do that. Right. And so it's just, it's a very dangerous game when yeah. you uh, start to take yourself too seriously. Yeah. I feel like any, anyone that is presenting themselves or self promoting them as a guru is setting themselves oh. up for so much vulnerability because any little fault they do, uh, especially if they get into the you know public presence, it's, there's so much of a downfall because they expect people expect them to be perfect. They're put on a pedestal. It's a, it's a tough job. Oh, it's, yeah, it's a tough job and they get stuck in the crap and like half the gurus out there are just plagiarizing other stuff and they're just like, you know, acting the part and the other ones um, who are look at me gurus are the ones that are like the ones that want followings and all this. Those guys are dangerous as hell. Mm -hmm. You know, the ones I've seen that I like the most are the ones that you wouldn't even know who they are sure. and they're just humble and they're just doing their thing and, um, they're beautiful. You can see it radiating through them. And they're, you know, you look at them and they just kind of deflect and point up and say, it, it ain't me, dude. It ain't me, you know? And, and, yeah. and so you gotta be really careful because there's a lot of people that are, you know, they've turned on the lights of the bug zappers and they're just trying to pull people in and it's parasitic. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one of the reasons why I came to media was I got drawn into it because there's so many of these douchebags basically false prophets out there just talking a bunch of nonsense, taking followers and misdirecting them or sleeping with their wives. And like, I mean, it's just, wow. there's a lot of ugliness out there. Um, and that ain't God, <laughs> that ain't it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I even, I don't know if this is even applicable in, in, in that category, but I don't know if you saw the Netflix documentary of Bikram and the, yeah. and the scandals that he's gone through. So that's, that's definitely one example that I can imagine. You they all did. Osho did. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I think the only one that I don't know of any scandals on was Ramana Maharshi, who I love. Um, but, you know, most of these guys, most yeah. of these guys, right? Even my great grand master, like when you get that kind of sexual power, like you'd see this 60 year old man with like 20 year old women and just like, it's like, what, it, whoa, what, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so there's just, there's a, there's also like a mistranslation. There's a different kind of ethical code that we have in kind of like a Judeo-Christian country that didn't really exist in parts of Asia where it was like, so what, you know, young girl, great score. Right. And, and so like, there's this weird kind of mixed cultural uh, moral code that isn't, it's, it's very ill-defined and misunderstood. And so for me to, you know, be a guy who grew up here, I, I'm also, you know, I'm a um, hospitaler knight in a Catholic, um, order. Like I've done a lot of stuff on hermetic Christianity. I've studied Kabbalah. I've, st I've studied it all. I don't care. Sure. Right. Sure. And, um, you know, just looking at, you know, the, the judgments we have on one culture versus another, it's just, it's, it's a mess. Right. And so it's very hard to look at something for what it is because we have preconceived notions that aren't necessarily accurate. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but you know, to me, you know, you know it's, are you being a good person or not? Are you, are you helping people or not? Are you being vampirical or are you helping them find their own light? You know, there, there's some very like kind of binary ways of looking at whether someone's good or someone's being, you know, not good. Yeah. And I think it's one of the things that I really appreciate about these religions like Buddhism or Taoism, even Stoicism, which is the, the fact that number one, you need less than you think you do and you're not chasing status so much. One thing that I was questioning about is the 
ability for some people to thrive in certain amount of ego. We all have a certain amount of ego that pushes us, that allows us to think bigger and, and dream bigger. And some people can channel that to be able to achieve things at a level that maybe someone that is completely satisfied with themselves may not be able to. So my question is, how do you balance that ability to be completely at inner peace and okay with who you are and needing less and not chasing status while still being able to think bigger and to have that level of ambition that a lot of people listening still want to be able to obtain? Yeah, I would say that the answer to that is in parsing some of the nomenclature. Um, I think that the great ones, the real great ones are, are not chasing status. Mm. They're chasing a big dream and a vision that is bigger than them, that is meaningful and moves the needle and rocks the world. Right. Like I, I'm, you know, we're doing a story right now with a guy who's really, you know, found this, the, the solution in math on kind of this technological revolution of transforming the world's energy into green energy and showing the you know, kind of mathematical basis of how it makes more sense and all this stuff. And he's not a look at me kind of guy. And I, and, and, you know, the dude's just a hero. Right. Because he's going after something, a vision that's so much bigger than himself, that's so important and meaningful and benevolent. Right. And you'll see that in a lot of these people. And you'll, you'll, you'll see it refractory. Like apparently, you know, um, Mother Teresa was a bitch and Gandhi was an asshole. Right. Like, you, you know, it's like they have this kind of refractory thing where it's like my way or the highway. So it's it's very difficult to, again, deify a human because we are all flawed. Um but I would say that, you know, one of my criteria for that is if the person's actually chasing status, that's a false god, mm. right? Epictetus said this best, you know, Greek philosophers, like if you chase after something that someone else has to give you, you're forever doomed to suffer, right? Status isn't something you give yourself. It's something you seek from others. And that is a, a dark, dark trap, right? And so if your storefront is, I mean, we all got to have a storefront. We all have an ego, right? Like I'm a, I'm a dude who, you know, speaks English and does what I do because of, you know, whatever my scars and wounds are. Right. And I've, and I've refined my storefront to have an interface that makes it easier and easier for me to kind of do what I want and not, um, suffer as much. And, you know, it's a work in progress like anyone else. Um, but if you refine your ego to just be, you know, a nice person who's also motivated and driven, that's going after something that's important and meaningful to them, who doesn't care about the status, but cares about the end result of something that, that you know, obviously doesn't harm others and hopefully, you know, is benevolent. To me, that's a great use of the dopamine pathways of your brain. And balancing the serotonergic pathways of, you know, the I'm, I'm cool right here, everything's great with the reward triggers of dopamine um, is, I think, a challenge, um, a neurophysiological challenge that we will um, be able to better identify in the, in the ensuing years. I used to own brain labs, like I'm, I'm very interested in this. Um, and I think that empowering the serotonergic, I'm cool, I'm okay, I'm happy, I'm comfortable pathways and then setting up the reward mechanism of dopamine to go after rewards that don't gratify the ego but are more benevolent and you know the rewards are hey you know we saved 20 million trees this week we fed you know 15,000 people last week those types of things i think i think those get better aligned and integrated with with a balanced human than having the ego fight the the self Right. right. And, and, you know, we could get into Freudian, you know, whatever. There's a, there's a lot of directions you could go with that, that dialogue, but I think that's kind of my, my short answer to a very big topic. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And shifting into the idea of, of being able to well, talking about urban monk and some of the lessons you've learned from Taoism and, and, and the lifestyle that you had as a monk, what are some of the things that you recommend people do to slow down time? This is a big one for helping people gain more focus and to be more productive, especially in such a chaotic world. Can you break down some of the core lessons that you've learned? Yeah, I mean, listen, time is ticking. Um, and what is time? Time is, you know, w what we've established it as, is, you know, the rotation of the earth and 
the the duration it takes for the earth to get around the sun one time is a year and then you start breaking that down into you know days hours and minutes and all that and that's all you know great there's celestial bodies spinning and we have this thing that we could all agree on that's you know kind of a common ground called time but our perception of time is very different um if you have 350 things on your to-do list today and you wake up in the morning already panicked that you're behind and I have one thing to do today, which is to, you know, get on my flip flops and walk down to the pool, you know, someplace in like some Mexican resort. The two of us have a very different experience of time, don't we? And so what is that? And that perception of time is something that can be modulated again by our consciousness, by our decisions, by our um, ability to manage our calendars and say no to things in time. Right. The guy who has 350 things to do that day can also just say, you know what? Screw it. I hate this. I quit. And then all of a sudden have this just like amazing drop in in anxiety and just go, holy crap. Wow. All I had to do is say no and walk Mm -hmm. away. I mean, that may or may not work for many of us in those circumstances that we're in. Right. But again, it's these are contracts and we're bound by contracts in time which are binding our word and our energy to events and things that are ensnaring us and and creating suffering for us or creating joy and happiness for us but again it's all just perception so you want to learn how to play this game i could teach you how but here's the here's the problem and this is where i've always been um you know very raw and honest about it is i can't give it to you and there's no pill I can teach you how to breathe. I can teach you how to observe your mind and your consciousness. I can teach you how to do the work. And if you practice it, you will know exactly what I'm talking about. And you will be able to be better at this game. You will be able to slow time. You'll be able to stop time. You will be able to help yourself out of the suffering cycles that come with bondage to time. And it's called meditation. I didn't make it up. It's been around for a very long time. Why don't we practice that? Right. And, and so for me, I'm just, I'm not an apologist. I'm like, listen, if you know, if you, if all this stuff sounds good, great, get on the cushion, do the work, the people that do the work over the year, tens of thousands of students and patients, right? People who did the work got better. People who came in expecting me to magically fix them have still, you know, are still shopping for other doctors or maybe are dead, right? It doesn't work unless you're involved. And that's the biggest trick the devil's ever pulled on us in the, in the modern era is to think the solutions are outside ourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, def- I definitely want, would have normally gone into the specifics of medica- uh, meditation, but we're going to save that for the end of the episode. And it's kind of like figuring out what's the best workout exercise. You just kind of have to do it. Right. As you mentioned, it's just a matter of just doing start it. moving. <laughs> yeah, just forget. start moving, man. Yeah. Don't worry about the equipment or anything like that. Um, but it's interesting that you say the, you know, the, the level of focus is going to be enhanced through this uh, idea of meditation. And for you, it seems like one of the other things that you do is just making less decisions. I heard from Jeff Bezos, like his job is to make three good decisions a day. And that's it. As someone that's, the wealthiest man in the world, uh, managing one of the most powerful companies. And it just goes to show you the importance of what uh, a high quality decision could get you in a world of leverage. Now we live in a world of software and media where everything is scalable and automated. And um, I think your advice around how to make more important decisions is is certainly a, a high critical thing for people today. What are some of the things that you've learned to help people make higher quality decisions apart from meditation? Well, those things are inextricably woven because, and I'm going to qualify this by saying meditation has been proven to power up the part of your brain, increased cortical density to the prefrontal cortex, What does the prefrontal cortex do? Negation of impulses, saying no to the guys when they say, let's get a drink instead of you going to the gym. No to the cheesecake. No to the new event because you already have events on your calendar. Higher moral reasoning, which the world can use more of, and rational thinking. So the very part of your brain that you need to help make better decisions and get your life together and be able to curate your life better gets strengthened with an exercise called meditation. 
So the more you do it, the better you get at the par- at using the part of your brain that allows for you to sit on that perch and make the decisions that matter and leverage your time and energy in a way that's more meaningful. Why? We live in the information age. What has become the currency of the information age is your attention. Your attention gets drawn out of your eyeballs into some box, some device, some some thread that is then designed with an algorithm to keep you there and keep you engaged as long as possible so that, that we can monetize that attention through bids to advertisers and make money off of pulling your eyeballs away from your life into some crap someone wants you to look at. Mm. So what's it going to be? Someone else's vision of reality with your eyeballs, your heartbeats, your energy, and your attention or your own. If you want to bring the nexus of power back and actually have control over your life, you have to regain your focus. And people are like, well, I'm not that focused. It's like, great. I'm not that great at pull-ups. How do you get better? You start doing pull-ups. You could do assisted pull-ups. You can work your way up to pull-ups, but the only way to get better at pull-ups is to do the damn Mm pull-ups. So don't tell me you're not good at focusing. I, I have 12 meditations available to you right now. Here they are for free. Just do them and you'll be better at focusing. Oh, but that means I have to work. Yes, it does. Right? And that's the thing I've been banging a gong on for a decade now trying to get people to wake up to is, listen, you've been sold sugar cereal as a child and all the way, all the way downstream from there, You've been convinced that there's something outside of you that's going to fix you. It's the next car. It's the next purse. It's the next whatever. That's all a delusional lie. You want to wake up? You have to regain your focus and get your attention back into your own forehead and out of the damn devices and out of the dramas and out of the news and back into the curation of your life, your life garden, your dreams, your aspirations. Yeah, right. So meditation, making less decisions. Uh, I know you talk about the time of the day of when to make these important decisions in your in, in your day to day basis. Um, can you talk a little bit about what time of the day would be the best based on our physiology and just the way our body works? Yeah, I mean, listen, the best time of day to meditate is as soon as the day starts, because you're going to set the tone for your operating system to be more mindful. And then hopefully you maintain that mindfulness throughout the day. Now, the best time to make a decision is once you've thought through and had a rational um, walk through your garden around that decision. The problem with decisions being made in the world that we live in is we've been influenced to become more and more impulsive which means you're not having rational thought and you're just saying, oh my God, yeah, I really need that purse. And before you know it, it's on your credit card. So the time to make the decision is once you've thought through. That's why Jeff Bezos, I mean, you look, he might take all day making those three decisions, but they're worth thinking through. So I don't like the idea of rushing through a decision until you've weighed out and, and, and really thought through the consequences, the pros and cons of everything so that you can have a rational, clear-headed decision that impacts the rest of your life, right? And so I think the biggest, the biggest thing there is don't hurry decisions. Weigh them out. Get in your right part of your brain. Don't be impulsive. Think it through. Weigh it out. Weigh it out against all the other things that would have to change if you said yes to this new thing. Then is it a yes or a no? Or is it a yes maybe later, right? But but make sure you look at all the things that you have going on in your life before you say yes to a new thing. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the other things that certainly helps us make better decisions is getting higher quality sleep. And this idea, the approach that you take of negating things rather than adding things was a uh, really yeah, key point that I wanted to address for people, which is removing things that you're doing on a day to day basis instead of instead of trying to find the next sleep pill or the next sleeping solution to help optimize your sleep. What are some of the things we should remove 
on a day-to-day -day basis that we're doing to help us optimize our sleep? Well, the first thing is just crack, right? Like if you're taking caffeine anytime after noon, it's suspect. Anytime after two, the half-life of caffeine being around six hours is definitely going to start impacting your sleep quality. So if you're living a life where you're needing caffeine to borrow energy from tomorrow to get through today, your energy economics are off and you're in deficit spending. And of course you're not sleeping, which means the next day you're going to go further into energy debt. So, I mean, that's the first place I always look just as a doctor, right? It's like, look, if you're taking stimulants beyond the half-life of where caffeine is going to be out of your system, you're in trouble. You're not sleeping. Then, I mean, just look at lifestyle and habits. I mean, most of, for me, yeah, look, people have adrenal stuff. They have hormone stuff. They have all kinds of stuff. But 90% of the sleep cases that I would see, it's just lifestyle operating stuff. I go banging through my day hard, taking caffeine, taking sugar, crashing, taking more caffeine, getting into the evening, putting the kids to bed, watching some dumb drama on TV and, you know, maybe paying some bills or, you know, scrolling Instagram and then turning off the light and expecting to fall asleep. You can't slam on the brakes and fall asleep. You have to decelerate in the evenings, which means getting the blue lights out, getting the screen time out, getting all the stressors out of the bedroom, learning to slow your roll and close the mental windows two, three hours before your intended sleep time and doing things that allow you to tuck yourself in calmly. Now, look, if you still have 54 items on your to-do list that are running through your mind as you lay down and, and say it's time to sleep, that's also a problem. Let's start managing your accountability to yourself or your expectations of yourself on those to-do lists so that you can feel like you're done with the day. Hey, great. What a great Tuesday. I can't wait to drift into a peaceful sleep versus I have so many damn things on my mind, but I need to sleep. God damn it. If I don't sleep, I'm going to be screwed tomorrow. You know, and just running all these narratives of not being able to shut it down. Of course, you're not sleeping. Right. And we go through lots of that in the urban monk. We go through that in all my books. Like it's, it's a big part of the rest and recovery cycles, but you can't rest and recover if you set yourself up for failure by putting too many things that you still need to do on the altar of your mind while trying to go to sleep. Good luck. Right. Right. And, and the last point you made, um, I think it was in your book, which is talking about eating healthy fat and proteins uh, about an hour before you go to bed. This was this was interesting for me because I've always been taught not to eat anything about four to six hours before you go to bed. And I wanted to know from your perspective, you know, how that aligns with some of the advice that most people get around not eating before they sleep. Yeah, just, just to contextualize that, that's for people who have trouble stabilizing their blood sugar. And so what happens is if you are a sugar fiend, and you are powering your energy with kind of fast burning sugar and your body burns through the sugar and you need more sugar and, and you're in that kind of insulin sugar yo-yo. What tends to temper the blood sugar for people who have problems with that, people who wake up suddenly and are hungry and you know their adrenals are shot, is we give some uh, sustained fat and protein so that the digestive tract has slow release energy throughout the night and doesn't get us to this place where the blood sugar drops, signals the alert systems. And look, if your adrenals are still healthy enough, then cortisol is there and it goes and grabs glycogen reserves and gives it to the brain so that the brain doesn't have to wake you up and you can stay asleep. But when your cortisol levels are shot and that mechanism isn't there, the next um, kind of alarm bell in line is, you know, epinephrine, right? And so you get into this adrenaline surge that pops you out of bed and you're like, you know, and your brain's saying, go get me some sugar, you monkey. And then, you know, good luck falling asleep after that. And so for people who have that type of problem with their sleep rhythms, yes, that is exactly what I recommend. And I think that, you know, Everyone's looking for the damn answer, right? Oh, I thought it was fasting. I thought fasting was the answer. It's like uh, for some, yeah, right. right? We're at a place in indiv individualized medicine where, look, man, there's different strokes for different folks. And every single person has their own nuanced way of finding homeostasis. And everyone's like, well, I thought it was time delayed eating. No, yeah, that, I mean, maybe for some. 
right? And so we're always looking for the answer in our pop culture, what's the next, you know, thing. And I'm very careful to say, look, yeah, that works for some. This works for others. This works for other people. Uh, you got to find it, right? You got to find it for yourself, for someone who has very bad blood sugar um, and, you know, insulin, ghrelin imbalance. Sometimes the answer is tempering blood sugar with protein and fat, and that helps them sleep through the night. And then that sleep allows for their body to heal and it helps them with their insulin resistance and it helps them get out of the quagmire that they're in. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a great way to put it. Now, before we start the the one to two minute meditation session for people that may not want to be meditating, although we highly recommend you stay until the end, highly recommend it, just in case. Uh, I just want to make sure people can find you online, uh, apart from checking out the Urban Monk, um, the Art of Stopping Time, Wall.org, all the websites that you are working on. Where else can people find you online, Dr. Pedram? Yep. Uh, whole, W-H-O-L-E dot TV is our new streaming media service. We have live yoga, tai chi, workouts, everything every day. We have films, we have docu-series, um, one-stop shop for all the media that I do and all the filmmakers that I like. Um, and then, yeah, the urbanmonk.com, the new book is called Focus, um, Bringing Time, Energy, and Money into Flow. Um, available November 10th. Um, and then I'm doing a free 21 day course called focus for anyone who buys the book. Um, and that's just my way of saying, Hey, listen, I'll hold your hand, get the book, read along. I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to help you find the focus that will then give you what you need to then bring your life back on track. Um, we live in an era where it's a crisis of consciousness and the Buddhists called humans who are unconscious, hungry ghosts looking for solutions outside themselves. Um, all the answers are inside of you. Once you develop your focus, you know where to look. Right. And so that's why I wrote the book. That's why I'm back, (laughs) you know, doing all the stuff that I do is because there's a crisis right now and we know how to fix it. Oh, well, thank you for it. Well, thank you guys for listening. We're going to end this with a meditation session from Dr. Pedram. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this episode. You can uh, lead us into it. Sure. Close your eyes. If you're seated, make sure your back is straight. Um, If you're driving, don't close your eyes. Um, If you're standing, just bend your knees slightly. Part of the magic of the triggering of the parasympathetic nervous system and dominance of that system is bent knees deep diaphragmatic breathing, and then touching the tip of the tongue to the roof of the mouth. So go ahead and put the tip of your tongue about one third of the way back to the roof of your mouth. And we're going to breathe. This is the simplest form of meditation is just breathe down to your lower abdomen, about three fingers below your navel. As if you have an imaginary balloon down there, inflate that balloon on the inhale And let's deflate it fully on the exhale. Nice and slow, rhythmic, deep breaths down to your lower abdomen. Tongue curled, touching the roof of your mouth. Back straight, knees bent. In and out. And if you find your mind is wandering, which it will do, just come back to the breath. Don't get mad at yourself. Don't feel like a failure. Just come back to the breathing. simplest form of meditation we have is just 
anchoring into something that's vital and real, like our breath. We need to do it. it. Connects us with everything, everything in the universe, the inspiration and the expiration of the breath. Ideally, you'd set a timer for, say, 10 minutes, push your phone away, do this, 10 minutes, anytime in the morning, anytime midday, ideally, you do it all the time, even while your eyes are open and you're driving, but just to develop a habit, do this every day for 100 days straight. What happens is people go, oh, I tried that. It was okay. Yeah, okay. How many days did you do that for? One, three, five. Keep going. Keep going. Takes a while to rewire the neurocircuitry to start suppressing the NF-kappa B pathways, the inflammatory cascades that get suppressed with meditation to develop the new wiring that connects up your prefrontal cortex. To help your brain find resilience, to nourish your system and relax your adrenals. You've spent a lot of time getting into the mess that you call life, the situation that, that you face the circumstances that you face. It'll take a while to get out, but it's the best gift you'll ever give yourself. But you got to do it. You're doing it right now. And it feels good. So keep doing it. Keep doing it. Go ahead and open your eyes. Come on back. I mean, that's as basic as it gets. How do you feel? Feel pretty amazing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, a couple minutes, three minutes, four minutes, 10 minutes, once a day for 100 days. That's the first stop on getting your focus back. And look, there's plenty of techniques and things, but. We all think that because we're so complicated, there needs to be a complicated solution to our complicated problems. But what if the answer to our complexity was simplicity? And we've been looking at it all wrong. Simplify, breathe, slow down, and you'll get more done and you'll get better results in life, guaranteed. Beautiful. Dr. Pedram, thank you so much for your time. And we hope you guys enjoyed this meditation session. Thank you.